Thanks for having me, and I'm amazed at how big this turnout this club is. I didn't realize how big you are, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. There's a few subjects that kind of take more, uh, more, more like folklore and wisdom passed along without a lot of science behind it, and some ideas that are not always right, and some big question marks that people have about how things really work. So. I thought I'd talk for a few minutes about antenna gain and a lot of minutes about SWR, which just about everybody measures, but hardly anybody knows what it actually is or how you can actually use it uh, very productively. Transmission line loss and then how to build an antenna that stays up. I'm mostly a wire antenna guy uh, based on living in a place where I can't have a tower. And I've built them, I've built black holes and things the last 20 years, and most of them have exceeded them. You can too, but there's some do's and don'ts about how to make them last for a long time. But the tree comes down. So tonight's question is, um, where's the antenna game really come from? Uh, why is SWR important? And then sometimes SWR is not important. A lot of times we tend to freak out if the SWR is more than two to one, and there's a lot of times when it doesn't matter. And uh, we need to get we need to get past this idea that if it's not two to one, it can't work. Uh, well, we'll look in a minute at an antenna that has an SWR of 37 to 1, and it's a terrific antenna. So, you know, get your mind recalibrated about when SWR is important and when it's not, and then how to build wire antennas. Uh, this, this is the most scientific of the charts. Uh, there's no more math coming, no more physics. Uh, but a lot of the conversation always tends to be in decibels, and uh, my comment to everybody is you don't need to know the math. The math's so important. There's logarithms going on in the background. You don't need to know what a logarithm is. Uh, so the thing you really need to remember is that decibels are dB add, and when they're adding, the results multiply. And the other thing to remember is 3 dB is half or times 2. So a, a um, gain, this pointer is going to be useless, I see. Yeah. A gain of 3 dB is a times 2. So if you had a gain of 3 dB in an amplifier and you put 100 watts in, you get 200 watts out. And in another 3 dB for a gain of 6 dB, if you put 100 watts in, you get 400 out. Notice we're adding on the left-hand side and we're multiplying on the right-hand side. Another 3 dB is times 8. Another 3 dB, which you get a sub to plus 12, is times 16. So if you had an amplifier or an antenna, with a gain of plus 12 dB, and for 100 watts in, you'd get 1,600 watts out. So every 3 dB is a doubling. Uh, works the other way, too. A 3 dB of loss is a, is a half. So if you have a transmission line with a 3 dB of loss, then you lose half your power, and you put 100 watts into a transmission line with a 3 dB of loss, you get 50 watts out the other side. You put 50 watt, 100 watts into a transmission line and you get 50 out the other side, where does the other 50 go? Heat. Heat, that's right. Uh, there's really only two places RF goes once you stick it in a transmission line. If it makes it to the antenna, it gets radiated, and if it doesn't, it turns into heat, which is, of course, not what we want. So let's take a look at some common antennas in terms of gain and dB. Usually we reference to something called an isotropic radiator, which is just a point in space. It's a hypothetical antenna that can't exist because it's just a point out in space. And we call that the reference, so that's zero dB. You got, and this is one of the points I want to make tonight, you've got to be really careful when you're buying antennas or just looking at articles to build them and make sure the reference is either in dBi or dBd. DBI is gain reference to this hypothetical um, isometric um, amplifier, I'm sorry, antenna. And DBD is gain reference to a dipole. A lot of the ads you will see, not QST, but other places, give you DB of gain, but they don't tell you the reference. And DBI and DBD are really different numbers. So one of the things to watch out for is whether or not you're dealing with DBI or DBD. 
most all analysis programs and people who are into this always use DBI, gain over isotropic. So a dipole in free space has about 2 dB, which is almost doubling the power uh, over a point source. A dipole over Earth has about 7 dB again. And the reason for that is um, now instead of radiating in every possible direction, if we're right above the ground, we're, only, we're not radiating into a sphere anymore, we're radiating into a hemisphere. We've lost the other half of the sphere. So we pick up 3 dB that way. Everything that used to go down is now going up. That's a factor of 2. That's plus 3 dB. There's something else going on I'll show you in a moment over a flat Earth that gives us more gain. Dipole over salt water, about 8 dB. Uh, four element Yagi, about 13 dB. Remember, 3, 6, 9, 12. That's, that's, times, that's better than times 16. So if you put 100 watts into that four element Yagi, it sounds like it's 1600 watts coming out of this isotropic radiator. And a vertical, which is not a great transmitting antenna typically, and also not so hot to receive, about four and a half dB. Um, it's better than a dipole uh, in free space, but it's not better than a dipole uh, in, you know, over real earth. The rest of the gain you get um, compared to this theoretical antenna is from ground reflection. And then in my summary, I'm going to talk a little more about ground reflection, but if you have an antenna, we're picking two gain up two ways compared to this theoretical point in space. One is the bottom's been cut off. We're not radiating down, we're only radiating up. That's a factor too, so there's 3 dB we just picked up. And as you transmit out or receive coming in, you get what people call a direct ray, but you also get a reflected ray. And that's as much as another 3 dB, which is why a dipole over Earth is close to plus 6 dB. You're picking half of it up by reducing that part of the sphere that you can't see, that's the Earth. You're picking another 3 dB up from ground reflection if you have a good ground. And that's why when you hit salt water, this reflected ray is almost perfect. If you hit very uh, lossy Earth, the reflected ray may almost not be there at all. And if there's a mountain in the way, then you get no reflected ray. So all of you who live near Stone Mountain, when you're pointing towards Stone Mountain, you're getting no reflected ray, typically. <clears throat> so there's 3 dB out the window. Um, so how do we gain some gain? An antennas, depends on whether you look at an antenna as a um, antenna or whether you look at it as a system. As a system, it can't have gain. You put 100 watts in, 100 watts comes out. Right? Gain is one, it's gotta be one. It's actually the first law of thermodynamics, and that's the only other thing I'm going to say tonight that sounds kind of sciencey, okay, which, which says you can't create energy and you can't destroy it. So you put 100 watts into an antenna, you get 100 watts out. You know, we keep talking about antenna gain. So where does the antenna gain really come from? Well, what's important is how much of the RF gets into what volume of space. And so we measure gain actually a watt per square meter and we're not increasing the watts because the antenna itself can't put out more than you put into it. But you can reduce the number of square meters that you're radiating it into. So the affected power in watt per square meter goes up by making the number of square meters go down. And we do that by shaping the beam. That four element Yagi has a very narrow front lobe and most of the RF is going into a very small number of square meters, so the um, antenna looks as if it has gain. If you're on the receiving side of that, it's loud. If it's more than plus dB, that's a factor of 16. It's 16 times louder than, than uh, an antenna with no gain. But as a system, it has no gain. You put 100 in, you get 100 out. But it sure sounds louder. That's really what we're, we're after. Every time you get gain from an antenna, in some direction, let's call that forward, you're stealing power from somewhere else, the sides, the back, whatever. That's really the only way you can take this 100 watts in with 100 watts out, make it sound like 200 or 400 or 800. You gotta steal the energy from the back, you can't stick it out in the front. This is um, a uh, 
typical chart for azimuth for a pair of antennas. I'm not sure everybody can see it. The uh, red line's a dipole, and the uh, blue line's a four-element Yagi. And you can see what's happening. The, the dipole really has no front to back. It radiates equally, excuse me, in two directions. We're stealing some energy off the sides, which allows the gain to be better than it would be out of the front and the back. But the four-element Yagi has about another 5 dB of gain over this dipole. And the reason why is because we've stolen all the energy that was going to go out the back and we piled it up and made it go out the front. There's no gain. There's 100 watts going in and 100 watts coming out, 4,000 or 1, whatever it is. But sure it is loud out here because we've taken all the RF that would have gone out the back and made an antenna that forces it all out the front. So that's where gain comes from. Gain uh, comes at the expense of radiation in some other direction. If you want an omnidirectional antenna, you can't get gain because there's no place, you're not stealing it from some place to stick it someplace else. If you want some gain, then you build an antenna that's comprised of elements in a way that steals antenna, steals gain, steals RF from some other direction like the back or the sides, piles it up the front. The other point I wanted to make is ground reflection is your friend. How high your antennas are makes a big difference in ground reflection. And ground reflection is worth 3 dB, and that's a double. Okay, so you can, between doing it wrong and doing it right, in terms of how high you are off the ground, you can pick up 3 dB for free. Let's call that free. Yeah, if you've got to make the tower higher, it's not exactly free. But, uh, or you need a taller tree, uh, it's not exactly free. But you don't need more power. It sound like 200 watts instead of 100 watts. You can do that by putting the antenna the right height above the ground and picking up that ground reflection. So the ground is your friend. And then I mentioned a minute ago, manufacturers are sneaky. QST, and it's so bad that QST, you'll notice in QST if you never looked before, that antenna ads do not advertise gain. The ARRL will not allow it. So if you start looking through QST and wondering what the gain of some of these antennas are, there's no number. The reason why is they're cheating. <laughs> some are putting it DBI, some are listing it in DVD, and some of them are just darn dishonest. So, or they're measuring under circumstances like salt water, but you don't have salt water, and they don't tell you that. So be really careful when you start um, assessing antennas, either the store-bought ones or the ones with articles, because those DB numbers, you really need to understand what it is they did, what it is they're saying, and whether or not they're honest. Okay, but that's it for antennas game. I'm going to hit all these subjects kind of quick. The next is SWR. I think it's one of the most misunderstood uh, terms of ham radio, and it's much more valuable to most of us than we, than we think. Um, it's always wrong. If you measure SWR in your shack, you get the wrong number. That's, that's one of the first things that should wake people up a little bit. It's always too optimistic, and I'll show you why. And then sometimes it matters a lot, sometimes it doesn't matter at all. Cable loss. Um, so what is it? Well, there's some math going on behind the scenes, which I'm not going to talk about. But basically it's just the ratio of the power going out and the power coming back. And if you put power into a perfect antenna, it doesn't reflect anything back. So the SWR is one to one, and you're happy, and pretty much everything else is happy. If the antenna is not resonant or detuned or, or in some other way not, de not designed to match your transmitter or transmission line, you will get reflect reflected power and then you'll get an SWR that's above one to one. Um, the difference between the power going out and the power coming back is the power that winds up in the load. There's only two places for it to go. It gets radiated, it turns into heat, or comes back. There's three places for it to go. It's always too optimistic. Unless, and, and there's one special case where it's one to one that may or may not be too optimistic. And here's why. It's important to know this because if you put up a dipole and it's at the end of 200 feet of coax, you're going to get a number that looks pretty good, and it may not be very good. And you, so you need to understand, it's hard to calibrate that out too, but you need to know in your head the number you're seeing on the SWR bridge is better than it really is. And here's why. 
virtually all the time we put the SWR bridge in the shack right next to the radio. And almost every new radio has one built in. So the measurement of forward power happens right at the transmitter. We're sending 100 watts out. The SWR bridge in the radio says, mm -hmm. I see 100 watts. Uh, a lot of us have that plus an SWR bridge or a forward power meter sitting right next to the radio. Especially if you have an amplifier, you may put the uh, SWR bridge after the amplifier. And it says, I see 100 watts too, forward power. Okay, here's a little example where we have a transmission line with a loss of 3 dB. So that's half, right? It was half the power. So if the forward power is 100 watts, by the time you get up to the antenna, there's only 50 watts up at the antenna terminal. And when the other 50 has already gone into heat, and this is a very common situation. Okay, a lot of us have transmission lines with at least 3 dB of loss. And we, it's not, a lot of times we don't know it either, but we do. You can measure this, by the way, before you put it up. Uh, MFJ analyzers and all sorts of other analyzers will actually measure coax and tell you what you got. If you have more than 3 dB of loss, you're losing more than half your signal before it ever gets to the antenna. And we'll, uh, transmit, same thing on receive, and if you're up on the higher frequencies, especially IVHF and UHF, you really don't want to throw away any energy on receive as well as not throwing any away on transmit. So um, 3 dB is a nice number to think about 3 dB or less of your transmission line. Anyway, 100 watts goes out and 50 makes it up to the antenna. I drew an antenna with an SWR 2 to 1 just to have something to talk about. That's 10% reflected. And it's got to come back down to the SWR bridge. So the 50 watts up here, 10% or 5 watts gets reflected, but by the time it comes down to another 3 dB of loss, we're down to 2.5 watts at the SWR bridge. Okay. We'd like to see half. We'd like to see 2 to 1 is half reflected. But we'll put down 100, and for half reflected up there, we're only seeing two and a half down here out of a hundred, or two and a half percent. That makes the antenna look great down here, okay, because we see almost no reflected power. Oh boy, good SWR, no reflected power. But you got plenty of reflected power. You're getting it burned up on the way up, and you're getting it burned up on the way down. And so the number looks a lot better than it is. And uh, what is the number? Well, in this little drawing, it's about 1.6 to 1 when you measure it down here, instead of 2 to 1. The only way to actually get this perfect is to take an SWR bridge and stick it up at the antenna, or maybe half, halfway, I'm sorry, so that you see the same amount of loss coming and going for the forward power and the reflected power. Normally, we can't stick the SWR bridge halfway down the line, so you're going to wind up with a measurement that's too optimistic or something to know. By the way, in the first transatlantic test in 19, 1921, most of the guys put... Were you there? No. <laughs> no, I feel like I was there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, my dad was on the air at that time. The, um, we used to put the ammeter to measure the antenna current up at the antenna and tune up by looking at it with binoculars. So, oh, God. since then we started putting it down in the shack, but you can't really put it anywhere. And depending on where you put it, you get different answers. So normally it's in the shack or in the radio, and that means it tells you it's better than it really is. So, okay, so what? All right. Okay, it's always optimistic, so what? Who cares? Right. Who cares? Well, I'd like to draw two distinctions by time. One I'll call day one, and then the other one I'll call as time goes by. Day one should be for everybody in the room tomorrow or tonight because what I want you to do is go home and measure the SWR of every one of your antennas across the band and write that down, okay? It's, it's really great to measure it the day you put it up, but it is here, we are now, so we are here and it is now, right? One of those things. And uh, so go home and measure it and write it down in a, in a notebook because as time goes by, it will change, and how it changes will tell you a lot about what's going on. Um, when does it matter? It matters, first off, 
when it's not what it's supposed to be. If you buy an antenna and it's supposed to be one to one and you measure four to one, there's something wrong. Okay? If it's supposed to be four to one and it measures four to one, there's nothing wrong. Okay? But that number will tell you whether or not there's something wrong. And no number is good, it just has to be what it's supposed to be. Um, dipoles, for example, are 75 ohms. Most of us use 50 ohm coax. That means a dipole should measure 1.4 to 1. If it measures a lot lower than 1.4 to 1, you've got a lot of loss in the coax. That's not good. If it measures a lot higher than 1.4 to 1, something else is broken. The antenna's not right. You've got a loose coax connector. There's something wrong. 1.4 is not a bad number. It just needs to be whatever it's supposed to be. If it's supposed to be 1.4, should be 1.4. Uh, I'll cover this on another chart, but loss in coax goes up with SWR. It also goes up with frequency. So a piece of coax at 20 meters is not as loss, glossy as a piece of coax on 2 meters or 440, but also a piece of coax at 1 to 1 SWR is not as lossy as a, the same piece of coax at, say, 6 to 1 SWR. So, the next thing you want to worry about in terms of does SWR really matter, the higher the SWR, the more the transmission line loss, and that, that's wasted power. And, and then the last thing we worry about sometimes is the rig doesn't like it. Uh, transistorized rigs, which is about all we use anymore, typically don't like anything above about two to one, uh, but that's what antenna tuners are for. So typically, they either, and the modern radios either come with an antenna tuner or you can get your hands on one. And so you can bring the SWR back down below to the one, but if you can't, your radio probably won't be very happy. <coughs> That's another reason why, why we care. Well, how about over time? Well, if the SWR is going up, it means your antenna is failing. Something's going wrong up above. You know, that got water in it. Well, it's got water in the connectors. And so if you recorded the SWR tonight or tomorrow morning, you go back a year later and look at it again, and it's going up over time. These things are subtle, by the way. You won't see it day to day, typically. I mean, tomorrow it could be 10 to 1, which means something broke. But assuming it doesn't broke, break. SWR may go up over time slowly which tells you the antenna is going bad. It may go down slowly over time, which tells you the coax is going bad. And you can learn a lot by looking at SWR. Why does it go down? Well, remember the SWR is calculated with that return trip. The RF goes up, the reflected comes back down, but it's making two trips, one up and one down. So as the loss in the coax goes up, the SWR goes down, okay? The antennas stay in the same, but things keep looking better and better and better in the shack. And that's bad. Okay? You, know, you really don't want antennas to change. You'd like the SWR curve to look exactly like it looked the day you put it up. They tend not to behave that way over four, five, six, ten years. You'd be amazed how different the SWR looks, and that's because the coax is changing, and the antenna is changing, and other things are changing. Um, and here's another thing that changes, summer versus winter. Uh, I actually have antennas, I can see the SWR change summer and winter. And it has to do with them being loaded down by foliage. These are dipoles that are kind of buried in the trees. I can tell whether it's summer or winter just looking by the SWR. However, when the SWR gets lower in the summer, it's because a lot of my RF is being absorbed by the leaves, and that's not good. So you, you can tell more things by looking at SWR. Uh, rain and snow, we don't have a lot of snow around here. We used to get ice storms around here, we don't get them anymore. Uh, you'll definitely see your SWR shift there. And then of course, things like failing, failing transmission lines or connectors, and a lot of problems with connectors, uh, can also make it change over time. Now, I teased at the BX Club when I put this note on here, and I'll, I'll let the teasing happen again. If I can leave you with one thing tonight, and you don't have it already, make an engineering notebook for your station. Get a three-ring binder. Mine's a three-ring binder with, I get paper, put one hole punch and make hole punches. Put paper in my notebook, and I measure the SWR of every antenna at least once a year. 
and I try to see whether the SWR is going up or down. If it's going down, the coax is going down. If it's going up, the antennas are going down. You can tell these things in the shack where it's nice and comfortable. You don't have to kind of tear your antennas down, take a good look at them. You can figure it out just looking at your SWR bridge. There's plenty of other things you can put in your engineering notebook and probably should. I added a page yesterday. Uh, there's a lot of Boy Scouts in the room, aren't there? You're, you're gonna Not as many as we'd like. <laughs> you're going to laugh at me. I don't know how to tie knots. Okay, I don't know anything about knots. So I, I was reading that the ideal knot at the end of an insulator for a wire antenna is a bowline, but I have no idea what a bowline is. So I went to the, um, to the internet and I printed out a page of how to tie a bowline. What I did with that, I stuck it in my engineering notebook. Right? Everything you need to know along the way that you learn, you stick it in your engineering notebook. And that it's not just SWR curves, it's anything anything you think is interesting. So, um, oh, the other, the other thing, actually, if you shift SWR, and I've seen this one too, is when you add another antenna. Because antennas couple, and sometimes the coupling distorts the pattern of one antenna. Coupling power to another antenna, can, if that antenna is not selected, can dump power into, into the ground. That's lost power also. So there's another thing. There's another item for your engineering notebook, right? You put the second antenna up, you measure the first one again, and you see if there's coupling. If there's coupling, you probably have no loss. You might think about moving these antennas a little bit. So do I have your, intention, have your attention on engineering notebook? Put, get an engineering notebook started. Put things in, yes. Part of my okay. I've got one antenna up, I decided to put another one up. Let's say I got one dipole going east and west, I decided to put another dipole up going north and south. But I'm not, I'm only using one at a time. Right. Okay. So, from what you just said, I should recheck my original antenna because the second. Yeah, well, the way you can tell if things are going on is by looking at SWR. That's the easiest way. And if it doesn't change, you're probably not coupling at all, or very, very little. But they can couple a lot. I, I'm putting some new antennas up right now, and I have a 40 meter dipole up, and I put another, I did just what you suggest, I put another, I put another 40 meter dipole about 30 feet behind it, but at the same elevation. I modeled it first. It turns out I built myself a two-element Yagi. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. There's no boom. Okay. <coughs> but, but one element is definitely coupled to the other element, and I now have front to back where I didn't want to be front to back. And you can see that in SWR. In fact, every time you load, now, so now the antenna you think you're interested in is like the driven element in a beam. And the more you load up more elements in the beam, the more the impedance of the, of the driven element goes down. Which, if it goes below 50 ohms, the SWR goes up. So uh, you can look at the SWR and see if they're coupled or not. They'll couple a lot. But the only way to avoid that with dipoles is to get them crossed. If you cross them at 90 degrees, they pretty much don't couple. Or get them very far apart physically, or get them very far apart in frequency. Two meter dipole will not couple to an 80 meter dipole pretty much at all. But a 40 meter dipole will couple to a 15 meter dipole like, like they're hooked up to each other. So you do have to pay attention to how close they are, how high they are, and uh, how close in frequency. And you can figure all this out by looking at your SWR bridge and keeping a station notebook. If I haven't gotten your attention yet on station notebook, Keep the station notebook, and if I still want to have your attention, keep the station notebook, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I can't make it do any more tricks, but keep the station notebook. It's one of the best things you can do, and um, it'll help you immeasurably over time. I can look up how to tie a bowline knot now, and I can be a, used to be able to do that. I take that notebook actually out in the backyard once in a while, and I'm going to put up another 20-meter dipole tomorrow, and I'm bringing the notebook with me because it'll tell me how to tie a bowline knot. Um, that's worth having a notebook. And it's so easy. It's, this is just good practice, right? Most of us don't do good practice a lot of the time. Me too. Me too. Okay. Transmission line loss. Let's talk about transmission lines. They're a killer. 
uh, on transmit and receive. LUS works both ways. I mentioned the LUS goes up with frequency. Let's take a look at two of the most common, uh, or one of the most common coax transmission lines, which is RG8X. That's the small stuff, 50 ohms. And normally we rate transmission lines in dB loss per 100 feet. So the time you had another 100 feet, that's of course more dB of loss. On 20 meters, it's about 1.2 dB per 100 feet, but on two meters, it's about 4.8. That, that's a lot more than three, okay? Which is three is half power loss. We're sneaking up on almost 50% power loss, or I'm sorry, 75% power loss. And so that's, that's a coax if you have a 100 foot run. You would never want to use on two meters. You'd want to use something bigger in diameter, which has a lower loss per 100 feet. Of course, it matters how long this thing's going to be. Coax is not that great anyway for really long runs. Because uh, every 100 feet, the dB keep adding up. And uh, there's no easy way around it. It does depend on cable type. There's a table in the handbook, uh, tables on the uh, internet. You can look up virtually every coax and figure out what the loss is before you put it up. And if you, if you know how to run the equations, you can then figure out how come you're at, you can figure out how much your SWR is wrong in the shack. If you're on 20 meters and this is brand new coax, you know you're losing 1.2 dB going up and another 1.2 dB coming down, which means almost 3 dB. Which means the SWR is going to be 30, 40 percent different than what you think it is. Uh, it goes up. Loss goes up with SWR. The more standing wave you have on the coax, the more lossy it gets. And the higher up you go in frequency, the more lossy it gets. And let's look at that for a second. Back to RG8X, which is the skinny stuff. Um, this is for 100 feet on 6 meters. At 1 to 1 SWR, it's below 3 dB, so you're losing less than half power. But at 3 to 1 SWR, which is not that big a number, you're losing quite a bit more than 3 dB, so you're losing more than half power in 100 feet of coax. The only thing that's changed is the SWR. As the SWR goes up, the loss goes up in the coax. In, in all transmission lines, not just coax. RG213 is 3 8 inch in diameter. That's the stuff we usually use for 50 ohms. Uh, definitely on six meters. Uh, it's about 1.6 dB at one to one, but it's sneaking up towards three dB at three to one. And you've only got to get to an SWR about four to one before you're losing three dB and there's half power gone. So on six meters, if you have a little more than 100 feet of RG213, you've lost half the power on transmit and you've lost half the power on receive. And on six meters, sometimes we're listening in the noise for DX. So losing 3D, yeah, I, I can't tell you how many stations I've worked less than 3 dB above the noise level on six meters. I've worked all kinds of stuff. 1 dB above the noise level, 2 dB above the noise level. You put a 3 dB loss of piece of coax in there, you don't hear that stuff. You know, it's gone. So it matters on receive just as much as transmit. In fact, it matters more because you know you can always add a bigger amplifier, right? If I'm putting 100 watts into this thing and I'm not very happy but losing half, I can get a 200 watt amplifier and make it up. On the receiver, you can't make it up, so um, you're stuck. Seven inch hard line, which is nice stuff, very expensive typically, although most of us get it from the cable companies as throwaways. As they go to fiber optics, they spools of this stuff pretty much for free. It's very low loss. So even the highest WR, it's very good. However, um, it's typically 75 ohms, and so you have a problem matching in and matching out of 75 ohms. The stuff that's really good, really, really good, is open wire line and ladder line. And for those of you who have not messed with that, uh, this is the ladder line, it looks like. For the old timers, this is going to be pretty boring, and for new people, this is ladder line. Ladder line is a balance line. And it looks fun. it is flimsy compared to coax, but the loss is just about zero. Uh, it's half a dB or so, and SWR doesn't bother it too much. It's about seven tenths of a dB on six meters. Uh, WHAI, here's a uh, open wire line. It's just two wires running in parallel. 
WHAI ran a thousand feet of this stuff right above the ground and tried to measure it. They couldn't measure the loss of a thousand feet. Um, it's down around a tenth of a dB or better uh, at almost all frequencies. So if you have really, really long runs at HF, this is pretty good stuff. Uh, and it's not that expensive. And you can make it yourself too. You, you get, I've made plenty of it. This is store bought, but um, you can make it. And uh, I bought nylon rod. By the way, one of the places for nylon rod is coat hangers. Go to Walmart, buy yourself 10 coat hangers, and saw the coat hangers up into little pieces of nylon and melt the wire into the nylon and get up the wire line. It's cheap. And boy, it's got no loss. So that's, a, that's another way to go. In situations where you're running very high SWR for very long lengths, you want to look at these balance lines. The, uh, yeah. Um, Right. Yeah, if I understand the question right, it's open the wire line looks great until you try and get it inside the house. And it kind of looks kind of difficult, doesn't it? I have seen people, I, I have never done this, I don't like the idea, bring it into the house. They, they literally drill two holes in the side of the house and bring it over the wire line all the way back to an antenna tuner, typically uh, right next to the radio. I don't think that's such a great idea. I tend to run a thousand watts. I don't, I don't really want a thousand watts from around the open wire line in the shack. So I don't like that idea. There, there's, a, uh, there's a technique, it's in the handbook, using parallel coax, one for each of the wires and open wire line. You short the shields together on both ends, and you run one of one each of the open wire lines down the center conductors, and you can bring that into the house and it doesn't radiate. And that's the technique most people use, and it works. What, what about just using a balin outside the house? Right. There's there's the other way, and that's my preferred way. Eventually, you've got to go from balanced back to unbalanced, and that's typically a balin. So you can put a balance at the outside of the house somewhere and come back the rest of the way on coax. And that's a great way to do it. Yes. But the open wire line and the ladder line really only work when you have them in free space, right? No, um, not really. The, the, the principle, of course, is the, the radiation from each of these wires cancel. Okay, you've got equal and opposite currents going in the two wires. Each one is a radi each one's an antenna, it's a radiator, but the radiation, they're right next to each other. And if you get two or three feet away, the radiation, by then the radiation is perfectly canceled, and so this stuff doesn't really radiate, just like coax doesn't radiate. The question gets to be, how sensitive is that stuff? You know, I, I've seen it run through a metal window frame. And the, and the person who did that thought it was successful. I'm looking at it thinking, that, that's not going to work right. You're going to heat up the metal window frame. I typically run it two to three feet off the ground. I don't have any problems with it at all, and I don't see any, again, since SWR is a great way to measure this stuff, I don't see any changes in SWR when I move it back and forth, up and down in the woods. So I think two to three feet, there's a number in the handbook, I think it's 0.05 wavelength, depends a little on what frequency you're on, but three, four, five feet off the ground is fine, pretty good enough. And I don't have to be in free space. Yeah. Yeah, how lossy are connectors? I mean, that's a really good question. The rule of thumb I use, and I think I'm being a little too conservative, is about a tenth of a dB every time you stick a PL259 in the, in the line. I think it's better than that. That would be maybe a worst case number. So yeah, you, know, you, you got a pair of PL two fifty nines on a barrel. That could be one point one to point two dB a loss. You really don't want to, you don't want too many splices. There's a good way to find. Well, there's a couple ways to find out. One way is to put an antenna analyzer on it, just see what you got. Another way is if you can develop fifteen hundred watts, you got a really high power amplifier. 
Put your hand on it. <laughs> if, it uh, if, it's, if it's warm, that's bad. <laughs> okay. And they'll get warm. You'll feel the coax. The coax is warm. And you feel a barrel connector. The barrel connector is warm. And it's because the contact resistance through there is not exactly zero ohms. And, and UHF connectors are not exactly 50 ohms. And they'll, they'll get warm. They don't get hot. But you, you can tell sometimes. And I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, I used to have an Alpha 99, which is a really good high power amplifier and will tune into anything. I have 10 to 1 SWR. And I had an antenna, I put an antenna up with RG8X and it, went, it worked great one day and from that, from the next day forward it never worked again. It went bad in one day. Uh, to the point I couldn't, couldn't decide whether it ever worked. You know, I thought it worked the first day, but I wasn't really sure. After a couple of months later it still wasn't working. This is in Maryland. I decided to inspect the coax, but it was under about six inches of snow and ice. So I couldn't really do that either. So I put a big amplifier on the coax, which looked almost like a short circuit. And I just ran 1,500 watts into the coax. And after about a minute, a hole, a smoke car, smoke's coming out. And I burned a hole in the snow and the ice. Right? There's this nice little circle where a thousand watts was getting dissipated in the short circuit. It turns out that, that squirrels that bit my coax one day after I laid it on the ground. And so I did have a really good antenna for one day, and after that I had a short circuit. But I found it by, by heating. You got problems in your coax. Very often you can go, ah, it turns RF into heat. And if it's enough heat, you can find it pretty quick. So keep your eye on SWR, but also, also there's the brute force way of trying to find somebody a problem. Um, anyway, Balance lines like ladder lines and uh, open wire are very good. I have quit using open wire line. Open, uh, balance line I like a lot better, or uh, window line. It's slightly more lossy, but not enough you would care. And snow and ice and rain don't bother this. Open wire line is a little sensitive to rain and snow and ice. So uh, if you want, also, occasionally, really everything I have is in the woods. Occasionally, this will brush up against branches and leaves and trees and things. And it doesn't seem to be a problem. Open, open wire, true open wire line, it is a problem. You'll see the SWR jump. And uh, I have often wondered, don't get too upset with me, about setting the woods on fire. Um, because at 1,500 watts, the current some places in this line and the voltage in some places in this line is enough to start leaves on fire. And so I'm particularly cautious about how much power I ran on this stuff when it's dry outside. I, I do not recommend this stuff anymore for the woods. If you're out in the clear, sure, why not? Other than it will change when it rains. Um, this is the final exam on this subject. I flunked, I flunked this test the first time I took it. And I'm supposed to know this stuff. Um, here's three cases. Interesting situation. This is an um, antenna that's in the handbook. If you open up the ARRL handbook, there's this antenna. And if you open up the ARRL antenna book, there's this antenna again. And if you do a literature search, there's this antenna again. And it's usually under the heading, if I could only have one antenna, where should I put up? And typically what people keep recommending is a 100-foot um, dipole, or doublet, really. It's more technically correct to call it a doublet. So here's three cases, same antenna, 100-foot doublet. This 100-foot this doublet is not resonant on any handband. Okay, so we're starting off with really high SWR, and I decided to just run two cases, so I took a look at it on 80 meters and 10 meters, and it turns out the SWR on both bands is about 37 to 1. Okay. Now everybody in the room has probably been trying really hard to get under 2 to 1 SWR, right? I've got to get under 2 to 1, right? And I can't, can't work without 2 to 1 SWR. Here's an antenna that's being recommended by all the experts. The SWR is 37 to 1. So there's your first clue that High SWR, if you manage it properly, doesn't mean things are bad. Things can be very good. This is a good antenna. 
if you feed it properly, if you feed it incorrectly, it's a dummy load. It's a waste of time. And um, everything's going to go up in smoke or up in, up in heat. So here's, here's three cases of transmission lines. The first one is RG, RG213 all the way. You got to have an antenna to her someplace because this 37 to 1 has got to get back to 1 to 1 for the transmitter. So we have a tuner in the shack and 200 feet of RG213. Here's a, that's going to be high loss. Right? And we have another case where we got 200 feet of um, this stuff, which is very low loss, and an antenna for in, in the shack. So we know kind of already that. Uh, B is probably going to be a lot better than A because this stuff's a lot, a lot less lossy. And the losses go up with SWR, and we're running a ton of SWR. Right? The case that they, they kind of threw in as a ringer is what if you kind of go half and half? So they came down to the ground, which is 50 feet, with open wire or ladder line, put the antenna tuner out in the backyard, and came the rest of the way with RG213. So we have 150 feet of the coax and 50 feet of the open wire line, or the balance line. Anybody want to guess what's better? It's C. C. Can you tell me why C is better? Because you balance the line and you the center. Yeah, why is that better? <laughs> this is not easy. Because your uh, SWR is going to go on transmitter part of the line. So it's so you're actually tuning um, the transmitter side of the line. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It depends on, again, what kind of lines we're really using. But the reality is that the loss, remember with the tuner here, this coax is running at one-to-one -one SWR, right? It turns out the loss in coax at one-to-one -one is a little bit less than the loss in balance line at 37 to 1. So you're actually better getting the tuner as close to the antenna as you can, and they suck it as close as they could, which is directly below it. It turns out at my station, this is how I do it. This is exactly the way I do it. I bring balance line to the ground and put an antenna, typically just a balloon, something, a tuner or a balloon, and I come the rest of the way back and collect. Well, that's my that, vertical that is, for an antenna with very high SWR, that is the most efficient way to do it. So actually what happens? Let's take a look. And some of this is great, some of this is really miserable. Um, 200 feet of coax, bad news. Let, let's call that 9 dB of loss on 80 meters and 12 dB of loss on 10 meters. 3, 6, 9, 9 dB is a factor of 8. So 100 watts going out, you've got 14 watts of the antenna. That's pretty bad on 80. On 10, uh, another 3 dB, so another having 100 watts out of the transmitter, you've got about 6 watts of the antenna. And that, you know, my point at that point is why bother? Okay. Also, you're suffering this degradation, again, two ways, transmit and receive. So you, you hear very little and very little hears you, you know, and that's, that's not good. Here's a very low loss ladder line, under 3 dB on 80 and just a little over 3 dB on 10. That's not bad. Shooting for 3 dB or better is a good rule of thumb. It, it hurts though to throw power away, doesn't it? You know, so for 100 watts, now we got about 50 watts at the antenna. Mm -hmm. People will hear you and you will hear them. That's not so bad. But this hybrid case where we get the highest WR on a transmission line that can handle it, but we get off of that onto one-to-one -one SWR as fast as we can. We're down on 80 meters down to below 2 dB a loss, so for 100 watts going up, we got two-thirds of it up at the top. That's good. On 10 meters, we're about 3 dB. That's not bad either. So are we picking up a lot by putting the antenna tuner underneath the antenna? Not really. As long, as long as you're willing to use mostly this, okay. Uh, if you're going to use mostly coax, you need to get the antenna or as quick as you can near the antenna so that most of the coax does not see the high SWR. Or your losses are going to be so high it's not, it's not worth putting this antenna up. 
Meanwhile, again, it's in all the handbooks. And I feel a little uh, guilty about that. I didn't do it. But without this conversation, I think a lot of people wind up doing this. You know, they put a, they put a 100 foot flat top up and put a ballon on it and come back with RG8. This is RG213. Can you imagine this with RG8? Get no signal up there at all. So then they say, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong. A um, couple of myths about SWR, and then we'll, then we'll be on to show and tell. Uh, there's this myth that if it's not as good as two to one, you can't get out. That's absolutely not true. Uh, we just looked at an antenna that's 37 to one, it gets out fine. You have the right transmission line, but then it kind of gets out fine. So with a low loss transmission line, you can run very high SWR and get out just fine. There are people, I don't know how this got started, that think high SWR causes TVI, RFI, telephone interference, and all sorts of other things. It does not. The RF stays in the coax no matter how high the SWR is, or it stays balanced on the balance line no matter how high the SWR is. So that's just not true. Uh, high SWR causes radiation from the transmission line. That's the same thing as interference at a different way. That doesn't happen. The RF stays in. A lot of it's turning the heat. You know, a lot of it's not RF anymore. It's turning in the heat, but it's not going places we don't want it to go. But other than heat, certainly someplace we don't want it to go. And the, the last one, people often say, well, the reflected power, where does it go? Does it get burned up in the rig? How come rigs are so sensitive? About two to one SWR, they start shutting themselves off. What's going on there? Is the reflected power burning up in the final amplifier? And the answer is no, it gets re-reflected. It's going back and forth, up and down the coax. It gets bounced up at the antenna, and then it gets bounced off the radio, back up again it goes. Yes, the radios don't like high SWR because that, that means there's an impedance at that antenna, at that radio that's not 50 ohms. And what that means for a given amount of power is either the voltage is going to be much, much higher, or the current's going to be much, much higher, depending on how long this piece of coax is and, and where you are along the way. And the final ampli transistor am amplifiers are not designed to handle that much extra current or that much extra voltage. So that's, that's why they're designed to fold back. Um, that's it. Any questions about SWR before we talk hands again? Yeah, that power gets reflected back up the antenna. That's where you get radiated off. Of. Yeah, it does. Not all. Yeah, that, which seems like that's okay. Right? That's what we want. Remember, though, on a lossy line, they keep losing. Right? I mean, you put 100 out, you get 50 up that's here, and then you get 25 down here, and then you, the first bounce, you get 12 and a half up here. On the second bounce, 12 and a half turns into 6, and then 6 turns into 3. So it second reflection doesn't typically radiate. Well, and what does causes what's called group delay, and you can start uh, your a, a, a tiny signal starts spreading out. Right, you got an engineer in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. The reflected signal <clears throat> is radiated a little bit later, right? Because it, you know, the velocity there's a velocity factor in coax, and it's not. Infinity. It travels slowly in electrical engineering terms. So the reflection gets radiated a little bit later than the main signal, depending on how long the coax is. Typically, that's not noticeable and uh, not a problem. But it can broaden your signal because it creates sidebands, because the radiated reflection and then the next reflection don't add directly to the main signal. They come out a little bit late and then a little bit later, and so it broadens your signal out. Very fast digital signals don't like Yeah, it. one of the places, by the way, that it uh, causes absolute fits is in TV broadcast. Because if there's any SWR at all, that reflected signal also gets transmitted, and that causes ghosts in the image, or it did when we had analog TV. Now it just causes pixelation, but you really can't. Broadcast, they, they stand on their heads for SWR. And, uh, in video broadcast. The audio is no big deal, but it takes no SWR at all to make a really crummy picture um, on television. There you can see group delay, or the delay of the uh, transmitted signal coming back out. Okay, real quickly, how do you build an antenna that stays up 20 years um, with uh, wire? 
first first um, tip is make sure you put the right lines on it, and absolutely the best line is Dacron. You can buy Dacron just about any place. Uh, you cannot buy decent Dacron at, at Lowe's or Home Depot, but one of my favorite sources is the Wireman, and there, there are quite a few sources where you can get back online. I'll put some of this out. People can play with it afterwards. This is a piece of Dacron line that's been up 15 years. I just took this antenna down. It looks about as good as the day I put it up. It, it just seems to be indestructible. I, I don't know. This won't last forever. And that's out in the UV and everything. This stuff just uh, lasts and lasts and lasts, and it's not that expensive. Other synthetics, okay. Um, nylons and things stretch, and they're usually not UV protected. If they're black, they're better. A lot of them are not black. You know, white rope is not good. The UV will just eat it up. So stick with Dacron. Um, an alternative I like, sort of, here's some wheat lacquer line. This you can get at Home Depot, right? And you can buy, go ahead and look at this stuff. You can go to Home Depot and buy a thousand foot roll of wheat lacquer line for like 20 bucks. It's cheaper than Dacron. And it's not bad, you know. It's got a funny property, which is a ton of spring. So if you tie a knot in it, immediately, <laughs> it immediately unties itself. So you need to know how to tie a bowline if you're going to use this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go into your engineering notebook and pull out that page that says, "Here's how you tie a bowline," or else you're going to be stuck. I don't suggest using this. K1ZZI and I put up an 80 meter um, um, delta loop, it's a pretty big antenna, and use this for the supports. And five years later, it was still up. We kept looking at it like, I wonder when that's going to fall down. It never fell down. He finally had to take it down. Uh, the, the only reason I would actually use this over Dacron is if it's Sunday afternoon and you're in a really big hurry and you don't have any Dacron, run over to Home Depot and buy some weed whacker line. And that'll be good for a couple of years at least, as long as you know how to tie a knot. So that's not bad. And you never hear people talk about it. Um, wire. This is flex weed, which comes from the wire band. Sometimes called silky. It's very, very flexible. That's very good. And it's not all that expensive. And it's very strong. So that's certainly a consideration. Copper weld is stronger still. Uh, actually, this open water line is made with copper weld. Copper weld has tremendous memory. So as you spool it off a spool, it wants to spool itself right back up again. I mean, it's really awful. <laughs> I use a lot of it, but it's really tough to work with. You can bend it. I can bend this right now and make it straight. And when I take copper weld off reels, I sit there and I bend it as it comes off and try to make it straight. Other than that problem, there's only one other problem with it we'll talk about in a second. But uh, that's very good and extremely strong for its size, size and weight. Um, hard drawn copper, which is what we call house wire, very good. Um, not as good as the others, but it's okay. And then there's soft drawn copper wire, which we sometimes call magnet wire, and that's no good at all. That's terrible. It's got no strength and will pull apart right away. I do have a use of for magnet wire. I'll show you that in a second. Insulators, uh, three kinds at least. This is a plastic one. One, one side has kind of a conventional loop it around and solder it kind of connection. And the other side has a bow line. Okay. And the wire, this is flex leaf. This is a lot stronger on this side. And uh, a little trick you can use. The problem with, and it, the dielectric properties of plastic insulators are very, very good. Almost as good as the ceramic ones. You typically will not notice the difference. The problem gets to be, this is one, I, a lot of mine are painted black for two reasons. I don't want the neighbors to see them, and it does help with UV. This is one that's been outside for 10 years. You can pass it around and look at it. It's become very chalky. It's starting to fail. It's starting to literally fall apart. So. <laughs> I'd say plastic insulators, maybe 10 years after that, are probably going to fail. And, uh, and you won't have an insulator anymore. Ceramic, good stuff. Um, 
really indefinite life. This has a different problem though with copper weld. We'll talk about that in a second. And then there's glass filled um, plastics. And that's these. They make um, end insulators out of this stuff. Inexpensive again. These are indestructible. They seem to last forever and it seems impossible to pull them apart. These are really good. They make center insulators out of it also. This is called a Bud Week. Bud Weeks have been for sale. I started in 1961. Bud were all over the place then. This has been around for 60 plus years. Coax connector on one side. These are indestructible and, and very, very good. And uh, they're creeping up towards 20 bucks now. Which I'm, a, I'm not a ham, I'm a cheap ham. Okay, so if somebody says 20 bucks for a center insulator, you've got to be kidding me. But um, it's the last one you'll ever buy. I mean, they, they don't fail. What is it about insulators and copper weld? Well, I've got an example here. This is another plastic one that's falling apart. Yeah, this plastic one is brown all around the holes. And that's not really brown, that's rust. And the big enemy with copper weld is if you let it abrade, the copper comes off. And then what's on, it's copper coated steel. And then the steel starts to rust. And if, if that happens out on the antenna, the, that spot turns into a high resistance spot and heats up when you're transmitting. And you, now you're converting more RF into heat out along the train, out along the antenna. It's subtle and it's hard to notice, but it's going on. And I, I had one antenna in Maryland basically fail that way. After a while, I couldn't hear much on it. SWR still looked pretty good. And what it, I turned the antenna into toaster wire, is basically what I did. Okay. The copper had come off, and it was cheap copper weld. And now I had steel, rusty steel wire. Rusty steel wire does not conduct RF very well. It also rusts to the point where it falls down. So on the edges of this plastic insulator, it's all rusty. And that happens from the copper weld working back and forth in the insulator over the years. And over the years, at these edges, uh, here you don't worry about losses, but over these, over the years at these edges, the copper is gone, all you've got is rusty steel, and eventually it falls down. Now that's probably a 20 year kind of process, so I wouldn't worry about it too much, but you can see the rust on, and that, that's not a good sign. That's, that's a sign you're headed into um, trouble. Um, where's all this stuff come from? I'm a big fan of the Wireman in South Carolina. They're on the web. Uh, they have all kinds of transmission lines, coaxes, um, balance lines, balance, uh, the silky weave, um, insulators, uh, everything I've got here in the, in the bag. Uh, DX Engineering, also on Array Solutions. They're on the web. They advertise in QST. Uh, DX Engineering tends to be a little pricey, but their stuff is very, very good. Hamfest, of course. Uh, be careful, especially with copper weld. Copper weld comes, if it's rated at, at a Hamfest, you may not see a rating at all. You don't know what you're getting. Okay, if you go to the Wireman, they sell things that are called like 40% copper weld or 40% copper. That's really good stuff. And the really junk stuff has almost no copper. The junky stuff's not going to work with it after a year or two. They're, you know, the copper will dissipate in any connection. And uh, you're going to wind up with steel wire, not copper wire. So you've got to watch what you're buying. Well, on copper weld, I would definitely buy it from a known source, like the Wireman or DX Engineering, because you know what you're getting. And you're getting top drawer stuff. And of course, on the internet, there's lots of places to buy all this stuff. Tie downs. Um, that's a white oak tree in my backyard. And I've lived there quite a while. These are kind of neat. This is a, um, uh, what do they call it, cleats out yeah, yeah. of the marine department. Cheap, strong, really strong. But if you put them on a tree, they disappear, okay? <laughs> which is kind of a problem. And here's one that I put on that tree 10 years ago and it's disappeared, basically. In another year or two, it'll be gone. And the one that's been there five years, I can't use anymore. I can still see it, and I don't want to try and remove it. And there's a new one, but I know five years from now I'll have to abandon that one too. Um, for temporary antennas, this is fine. For the long term on a tree, this is not fine. Uh, but they sure are cheap and neat. A much better tie down is, 
we're almost finished here, folks. An eyeball. An eyeball. Uh, they're nice and strong. You can get them all different sizes. I paint them black again so the neighbors can't see them. And every time the tree grows, I go out with a screwdriver and turn it another turn out. Okay, so every year the tree grows a quarter of an inch and then take another turn. And you can keep doing that for the rest of your life or the rest of the life of a tree. So these, these don't tend to disappear unless you let them. And I tend to hook on. I tend to hook on the snaps, but you don't have to. You can tie straight to them. They're not as convenient as a cleat. And I've lately put some cleats onto a steel plate and a steel plate on the tree. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Might be okay. But I'm doing this mostly. And that works well. Okay, have tree, tips for tree sway. Copper weld's really strong. Um, you can almost hold up a tree with copper weld. Um, might be strong, but stronger than the plastic insulators. But you know these big trees, and I'm, I'm talking about 80 footers, and the wind sometimes go like this. So when they're going like that, you can have hundreds of pounds of force on the antenna. And so the easy way out of that is as is shown here, and that's straight out of the handbook too. Get yourself a cheap pulley, so the clothesline pulley. If you want to really go full, full, full bore, you can go into the marine catalogs. Go down to West Marine, you can buy the marine stuff. That stuff is really good, expensive, but very good. Put a counterweight on it, and when the trees blow, the weight goes up and down, and you're all set. This is um, my version of that. My weight is quite inexpensive. I found it in the backyard, and uh, the pulley came from Home Depot. And this has been up 10 years, and uh, the wire has yet to break. This is on an inverted V, but this thing moves a lot. And I see the, in the wind, I see the brick on the ground sometimes, and I see the brick slam up into the pulley, but it just sits there happy. So that works. And here's what you do with magnet water. This is what I call a mechanical fuse. Electrical fuses and mechanical fuses. And this is an old Navy trick, by the way. Uh, you bring a wire. To, you don't want to do this up above, but if you're going to bring a wire over a tree limb down to a place where you can get to it, you build yourself a loop and you connect across the loop with something that's going to break. It. And that's what this is. There's my loop, and there's my piece of magnet bar. And if the trees really start going, I can't quite break it. I just added four or five, you make it as big as you want. I just added four or five feet into the antenna tie down, and now the rest of it's not going to break. After that happens, you go out in the backyard in the morning with some more magnet wire, and just hook it back up again. That's about as cheap as an electrical fuse, and mechanical fuses work really, really good. And that's it. Thanks for your kind attention. I'm happy to take questions on any of this stuff. <laughs>
but it's still hot enough if you really go on copper weld, you'll see it turn blue. You see the copper oxidizing and changing. And you're in a situation where the copper and the steel are both being, the steel's probably being annealed and it's changing its metal. And the, cop, the copper's turning funny also. And you really don't want to do that. So you got to watch the heat when you solder copper weld. Yeah, I'm sorry I took so long. Any more? I got oh, a, yeah. a double question now. Uh, one is, what what is his normal life expectancy of a, a coax out in the open? Yeah. And uh, the second part of the question is, if you have, like I, I bought a thousand foot spool of coax a, a number of years ago that was new. Now I've got that, half of it still left in inside my house. Is, mm -hmm. is it deteriorating? Or yeah, how, how does coax age? Yeah. Inside, as far as I know, that's been I mean, I, I, I bought, K4JA was a gigantic station and they um, shut it down. I, I bought a lot of stuff there, including coax that was probably 25 years old when I got my hands on it 17 years ago, but it had never been used, and I still haven't used it. But I, I measure it once in a while. It's like brand new. That stuff lasts forever. Outside's a different story, and it depends on the jacket. And you will notice, if you go to the tables for coax, and there are dozens of types available, the jacket determines really how well that coax is going to hold up. I just bought some RG58C, which has an indestructible jacket and is variable. That stuff will last outside for more than 20 years. RG58A will not. The, the jacket is very porous. And I'd say five to ten years, you're going to start seeing loss in RG58A. So, and then the question comes up about burial. Uh, there's something called Davis Buryflex. You can directly bury it in the last 20 plus years in the ground. And if it's not buried, probably 30 years. It's really, really good. Heliax, which is a, really a hard line. Hard lines best outside just about forever. Your typical coax that you buy in a hand pest, and it's a little mysterious what it even is. 10 years, you know, before you should replace it. People throw that stuff on their towers and 25 years later it's still on the tower. And they don't realize it, but they're losing three or four dB they didn't used to lose because the coax is going bad. Here's a little um, tip on coax. If you ever cut, the co ever cut coax and the shield's black, throw it away, all right? You can still get RF to go down it, but RF, moves by skin effect. It moves on the very surface of the copper. And that braid, first off, the braid's not continuous, okay? All those wires in the braid, they stop and start. They, they put new spools on the machine, and, and uh, you could separate one braid and test from one end to the other, you'd find it's open circuit, okay? What they're relying on is the weave and the point contact from one piece of the braid to the next, and the RF is moving down those point contacts one piece of the braid to the next. Except when it's all black, it's not copper, it's copper oxide, and that's not a conductor. And the shield integrity is out the window when it turns black. When copper, when, um, when the shield and coax turns black, throw it away. There's no way to fix it, and it's not worth trying to use. It's, it's done. You also can't solder to it. I mean, it's just, it's over. <laughs> I've thrown a fair amount away. Any more? This is a stupid question. They always say the feed line needs to be parallel to a dipole. Is that? I'm missing the question. In other words, when the, 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 the perpendicular. Perpendic oh, thank, yeah. thank you. I was missing the word. Yeah, do I really have to feed a dipole exactly perpendicular? No, not really. Uh, it's the best practice. If you have a ballon up at the antenna, you're stripping most of the R, all of the RF off the shield, which is really what you want. If you start to move the wire the transmission line closer and closer to the antenna, then you're starting to put RF back on the shield, which is not good. It usually radiates anyway, but you're messing the pattern up. Because the dipole radiates one way, and this sort of vertical external shield is radiating vertically, not horizontally, and giving it some pattern shift. Is that a big deal for dipole? Uh, typically not. You know, a lot of people run them with no balance. What about balance line, by the way? Yeah, well, ba um, balance line is so impervious to unbalance from nearby things 
I don't think you need to come off the antenna anywhere close to at 90 degrees. And I've got a lot of them. I don't come off at 90 degrees. Mm. They behave exactly the way, the way they're designed to behave. Yeah. You mentioned with a dipole, ideally 90 degrees. How about an end bed where you don't have the other halves? Yeah, well, still 90 degrees. But, but how about if you open that to 135 degrees? Would it be better or worse? I don't know. I'd have to model it. Uh, I would think potentially the same or slightly better. NFEDs, NFEDs are not forgiving antennas. When you feed a regular dipole with feed points of 75 ohms, that's a pretty low impedance. And we're usually dealing with coax at 50 ohms, and that's a very low impedance. Okay, So it takes a lot to disturb that point in an antenna because it is a low impedance. The impedance at the end of an NFED wire is three, four, five thousand ohms. So you don't need hardly any coupling at all to a, a point that that's high of uh, an impedance like that before you shift it. It's very sensitive to shifts. So coax coming off at 90 degrees is really the right answer. I'm not, and I certainly would not bend it back. If you bend it out, probably fine, but I don't really know. I don't really know. Anyone else? Thanks very much. Enjoyed it.